but some don't. Um, so it's salvational. We're going to be saved. And it is sometimes supernatural and sometimes natural. And we will talk about that um, in a second. But basically, given Jewish history, we understand that the Messianic age was a way of assuring people that they would not live in this misery forever. Because even the good times of the Jewish people were sort of al soft, like on the verge of turning back. And, and, and until the modern age, no Jew had the illusion that everything was going to be fine forever if the Messianic age didn't come, because they had seen too often. And they knew that they were subject to the whims of the populations around them, even on those occasions when the populations around them were benign or the ruler was protective, um, rulers died, good and bad, right? Um, so the, uh, the Messianic Age was a constant consolation and comfort for Jews throughout their history, um, so much so that uh, in times of uh, acute distress, Messianism became more imminent. Um, I told the story before, but I remember my teacher, Elias Slomovic, who grew up in Slovenia, and, and it was, that I can't tell you what country it was in, because it depends what week it was, um, <laughs> but, but he said if they heard a sound in the middle of the night, people would rush out into the streets thinking the Mashiach had come. It was that immediately palpable, and we're talking about somebody in the lifetime of many people here, um, so this sense of danger and messianic salvation was really powerful for most of our ancestors. And although we will come to this a little bit later, one of the reasons why it is not as powerful for us is because of the life we live. It's not only all the other structural changes in intellectual history that have happened in modernity, but it's also because it the, the need for the Messiah is less acute among modern, among, let us say, among our people like those in our community. Okay. Um, the biblical basis for the Mashiach comes in several different places. The most famous, which I'm just going to read you a little bit of, because this is also a passage that Christians always point to, is in Isaiah, and there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow from his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be fear of the Lord. He won't judge by what his eyes see, nor by what his ears hear, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor. So it goes on a little bit, but it's the same idea. In other words, there's going to be a ruler who will restore righteousness to at least the Jewish people and maybe the world. Obviously, I, and I don't want to get into Jewish Christian politics at the moment, though I'm happy to at another time. Obviously for Jews, this is a person, right? This does not sound like, it doesn't say a divine being, it doesn't say my special son, but that's how Jews read it. I don't want to, I, I really don't want to do the polemic now, I'm just telling you, what we believe um, based on our reading of the text. And, um, and some, of the, uh, some of the messianic visions are really beautiful and poetic. Um, your old men shall see visions and your young shall dream dreams, right? That's from Yoak, uh, a prophet who um, is one of the minor prophets. Minor prophets, by the way, being prophets who have small books. Not prophets, seriously, not prophets who are unimportant. The Treas are the 12 minor prophets aren't minor because they didn't say anything that mattered. It's because Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah all have really big books. They are the major prophets. Um, but Amos is very important, he just has a smaller book. Um, so uh, there's, there's some kind of lesson in that, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, it's like a major sermon and a minor sermon. Oh, rather, I only spoke five minutes, it's obviously a minor sermon. Uh, high Holidays gives a major sermon. He speaks, you know, a half hour, 40 minutes. That's a major sermon. So, the same idea. Uh, but the, the artistic impulse in the Jewish tradition 
often found expression in messianic visions, as you would expect, um, because to be able to describe wonder and joy and you know and and the ziva shchina that the the, the um, light of God's countenance, how it shines on the people in Gan Eden after they die, and and you can and the rabbis. When, when you talk about like what that world will be like, you know the rabbis assumed that everybody will study Torah, um, and uh, and it will be a, a world for the supernaturalists of no want. Um, the famous image of the lion laying down with the lamb that was taken literally by the supernaturalists. That is, the whole order of nature will be different when the Messiah comes, and everything will change. And you can understand that, especially, first of all, there's a, fun, there's a mythological, imaginative, psychological function, and then there is a, an historical function to this. By which I mean, people like to imagine utopias and what utopias are like. There's a long history in Western literature of utopia. Those of you who shot that arrow on, <laughs> right? Samuel Butler, Samuel Butler wrote a utopia called Erewhon. <clears throat> and Erewhon, have you ever figured out what it means? Nowhere. Nowhere. It's nowhere backwards. And that was Sam Butler's point was, the world I'm going to describe exists nowhere, but he and Thomas More, who wrote Utopia, they all tried to like imagine what a perfect world would be, and utopian imaginations went into messianic imaginations in the Jewish tradition where people tried to imagine what would it be like if this world were perfect. Um, and so you have some thinkers, um, elaborated uh, actually by a thinker that I have a great affection for, for a lot of reasons, the Bravanel, who escaped the Spanish Inquisition. He wrote three books about messianism. And his messianism is characterized, first of all, by supernaturalism, he's a supernatural messianist, and also by revenge. That is part of what's gonna happen is the enemies of the Jewish people will be thrashed for all the terrible things that they did. And before you think less of a Abravanel, remember that he and his entire world were overturned in the Inquisition, and everybody was exiled. And in fact, he served as the treasurer to Ferdinand and Isabella. And there was a plot by the Spanish government to kidnap his grandson so that he would stay there and continue to be the treasurer. And you can imagine that the temptation on someone like a enough to convert, because if he converted, he could have lived a very good life after all. He was very high up in the government. Must have been great, but he did. He went into exile with everybody else, um, and so uh, I feel about his desire for revenge, sort of the way I feel about when we open the door on Pesach and say Shvoch Hamacha, pour out your wrath, which is it's very easy for me to say, boy, that's terrible, but I, I have no wrath to pour out, right? But if you live in a place where on Pesach there are persecutions and where there are claims that Jews are begging the blood of Christian children in Matzah and so on, then pour out your wrath becomes a pretty understandable reaction, especially because honestly, it's pretty benign to open a door and say, you know, I pour out my wrath. I mean, if that's the worst revenge that Jews ever take, um, it's not even the end of the book of Esther. So, okay. Uh, the Lion and the Lamb. So, I guess you can still quote this. I, you can still quote uh, Woody Allen in this uh, context, right? So you know what he said. He said, the lion may lay down with the lamb, but one of them isn't going to get much sleep. Um, and, uh, and that idea, as funny as it is coming from him, is actually an idea that has a fairly long pedigree because there were the naturalists, too, who didn't believe that the world was going to change entirely. There is this wonderful passage in the Talmud in Avodazar where um, Rav is lying in a, um, in a, where he passes by, he passes by this um, man who is maybe a convert, who, and I can 
converted out of Judaism, that is, who left Judaism. It's not clear. But anyway, you parshesha, I think is his name. I don't remember at the moment. It's been a while. But anyway, so you pass it by, and the guy's lying in the bath of water and watching naked prostitutes dance in front of him. Why Rob was passing by them? Now I'm sure he's on the way to the study hall. Uh, so, so he says to Rob, do you have anything better than this in your world to come? And Rob says, yes. We have the Jewish people not ruled by the Goya. Not ruled by the Goya, by the nations. By the nations. Now, the fact that that was such a utopian idea that if we could rule ourselves it would be so wonderful alone tells you what it was like. Um, I remember we were talking about a Rome where the temple was destroyed and the Romans, you know, the Romans uh, were, were to the Jews at least an evil empire. Um, and, and also it says that uh, well, Rob, he doesn't say, yes, we have a world in which everybody gets along. He doesn't give a supernatural alternative to that. He doesn't say, yes, a place where everybody is satisfied and you don't need, uh, you know, satisfactions of the flesh. He doesn't say that. He talks about political liberation. And for many, um, most famously, as we'll get to for Maimonides, but for many, political liberation was what Messianism was all about. Um, so much so that, as you know, or I assume you know, uh, when, when uh, Herzl proclaimed Zionism, there were people who really saw him as a modern messiah. And it wasn't for them crazy to see him as a modern messiah, because if you see it as political liberation, then he was a modern messiah. And I, I want to remind you that this is, again, in a long tradition, because Rabbi Akiva, Sar Bar Kokhba as a long messiah. And those names don't mean as much to you as I'm assuming they do by saying that. What I will tell you is, first of all, Rabbi Akiva was probably the greatest of the Talmudic rabbis. Um, and and uh, Bar Kokhba was the one who led the revolt uh, that, was, that ended in destruction and persecution in the 130s, the middle of the one, uh, of 130 AD, uh, against uh, when Hadrian um, put down the revolt and persecuted the Jews, and Bar Kokhba and, and Rabbi Akiva thought that Bar Kokhba's uh, was the Messiah, and the revolt would be would win, and the Messianic age would come. Um, and and uh, a much less, as often happens, a much less famous rabbi named Rabbi Yeshua ben Torka, who we don't name schools after, but sometimes people you don't name schools after prove to be right, and people you name schools after prove to be wrong. Rabbi Yeshua ben Torta said to him in a very memorable phrase, Akiva, grass will grow from your cheeks, and the Messiah will still not have come. In other words, you'll be dead and buried, and we won't have the Messiah. Um, but Akiva, whatever else he was, Akiva was an, was an optimist. Um, but, but here's Maimonides. Uh, I don't have the very end. I should have. Uh, I should have. In fact, I'm going to look it up and, and read it to you. Um, but he says all these and similar matters are coming about the messianic age. Um, a person cannot know how they will happen until they happen, for these matters are undefined in the words of the prophets. Um, Moreover, even the sages have no established tradition regarding these matters, but only their interpretation of the verses. Therefore, there is disagreement among them concerning these matters, and neither the order of occurrence of these events nor their precise detail are among the basic principles of our faith. In other words, you can believe whatever you want, says Maimonides. Um, it doesn't necessarily, it is not necessarily true, and, and you can't know what is going to happen. Um, so he then goes on to explain, I'm gonna read you also the very end, um, of it, uh, he goes on to explain that the lion laying down with the lamb means big nations and small nations will get along peacefully. That's what it really means. Because Maimonides, remember, is a rationalist. He doesn't like 
supernaturalism where you don't need it. That's what I would say. It's not that he doesn't like supernaturalism. I mean, after all, he's a believer, but he doesn't like supernaturalism where you don't need it. And he prefers to interpret things metaphorically when he can. So this is Maimonides' beautiful vision of the Messianic age. At the very end of his whole code, the whole mission of Torah, his giant code of law, okay? Many, many, many volumes. This is the very last, I'm gonna read you the very end of the mission of Torah. So now you can say, yeah, I finished it. I finished the mission of Torah. <laughs> um, no problem. In that era, he's talking about the Messianic era, there will be neither famine nor war, nor envy nor competition for good. Then your competition, for good will flow in abundance and all the delights will be freely available as dust. The occupation of the entire world will be solely to know God. Therefore, the Jews will be great sages and know the hidden matters, grasping the knowledge of their creator according to the full extent of human potential. As Isaiah states, the world will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. That's his messianic age. So there's nothing about people will live forever and no one will have pain. There's nothing, remember my mom was a doctor. There's nothing about I'll never have to treat a disease again. It's about everybody will just want to know God. In other words, everybody, you should forgive me, my mom in other words, everybody will do what my mom spends his life doing. Right? Which is being a Jewish philosopher, in a way. That's what he thinks of as, you know, the best possible life. And I have to say, if you're going to pick one best possible life, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's as good as any, certainly in our tradition. Um, and, and also, subtly, or maybe not so subtly, it does elevate the Jewish people. Because the point is, we have the inside track on this, on knowledge of God. So the other nations will come to us to learn what they don't know because we do know that. But it's not, but it's a different. It's not like a Bravanel's revenge. It's not we're going to go out and and you know kick them in the gutter because they did all these terrible things for us. No, it is they will be enlightened and all of a sudden realize this is what this is all about. Um, the one other great division that I want to speak about, which Maimonides sort of supports, although not explicitly, is a messianic age as opposed to a messianic individual. So there are those who believe, you know, when, when, when for example, Chabad says we want Mashiach now, they're envisioning a certain person. And as you may know, there were many people in the Chabad movement who thought that the Rebbe was the Mashiach. Um, and uh, and I'll tell you, um, I spoke, and I know a number of Chabad rabbis who, and I have done this, who if you get them in a private moment and you say, look, I'm just asking you person to person, I don't want to quote you, I'm not going to talk about it publicly, do you believe the Rebbe's and Michelle will say yes, right? Even though publicly they won't say that necessarily because they know how it looks. And one of them said to me, I think with a lot of, uh, with a lot of sense, he said, the people who say to us, not, not always, because there are, but many of the people who say to us, you're ridiculous for thinking of the Rebbe as the Mashiach, are people who don't really expect the Mashiach. But if you really expect the Mashiach, then who better fits that profile? So I said, okay, I mean, I understand that, although the fact that he died, he had a stroke and he died, is, puts it, sort of kink in the <laughs> operation, um, but we know other traditions where <clears throat> that has not proved to be the end uh, of the uh, messianic uh, belief. So I will just leave it at that. Um, uh, the, um, those, of you, those of you who want Jewish arguments against it are advised to look David Berger, who is a very fine modern Orthodox scholar, wrote a book Called, uh, I think it's called The Rebbe, the Messiah, and the Scandal of Orthodox Indifference. Because he thinks that, they, that anybody who believes that should actually be literally separated from the mainstream of the Jewish community. But you can look that up and make up your own mind. I, I do not pronounce anathemas at lunch and lunch. Um, so, 
But the idea that, that it's an individual um, is in some ways harder, I think, for moderns, moderns meaning to, to believe than, than a, a messianic age. Right? A messianic age is something that obviously human beings can gradually and gradually get closer and closer to, whereas a messianic individual seems like somebody who must be invested with some kind of special powers that's very hard to imagine, although, um, not although, but, but I, I want to remind you that we do see over and over and over again in the political realm that the human capacity, not even capacity, the human tendency to worship as almost divine other human beings. And not only in the political realm, you see it in music, you see it in sports, you see it in entertainment. The capacity to invest other human beings with magical <coughs> gifts and powers is incredibly persistent and powerful. And I remember, actually, I will, uh, I will share my one messianic experience with you. So after, you know, I had a brain tumor and I had brain surgery, and I remember lying in the bed. And I remember, like, shortly after I woke up, um, when I was almost completely there, I was still a little hazy, but I was reasonably, I probably couldn't have given this lecture, but I was reasonably there. <clears throat> the doctor who had operated on me came into the room. And for a moment, I saw him as, like, God. And then, I was surprised at myself. And I thought, oh my gosh, what you just felt? That's that feeling. And I didn't know that I, I mean, I assume I had been because I'm a human being and human beings feel that, but I had never felt it like that. But I, like, looked at him, like, I mean, after all, the guy just had his hands in my brain, so it wasn't totally crazy. But, but I, it, was, it was astonishing to me how much you can invest someone with that kind of supernatural glow. And we see it again and again and again in different communities. Um, it's the way certain people in very traditional communities, for example, speak about, not, not only the love address, speak about their regular. Um, as though this is a person who has transcended normal personhood. Um, and so the belief in the Messiah is not a crazy, you know, it's not an outlier belief in human history. Um, people have believed in all sorts of Messiahs just in different ways through different times uh, and periods. So that is a sort of quick outline and crazy of, of the messianic idea. I do want to just close by saying that um, teleology, which is the Aristotelian term, you know, a telos is an end. There are two different ways of life. You know, you can be motivated by what happens before you, you can be motivated by what you're headed towards, right? So being motivated by what you're headed towards is teleology. The, the teleology of having a messianic idea is incredibly powerful for the Jewish people and I think has been one of the factors that has enabled us to survive. Because if we didn't believe that there was a messianic possibility, we would have been in many, many times, in many places, deprived of hope. And thought there's no possibility that one day this is all going to come right. Um, because of all the possibilities of Jewish history, like modern America in the Middle Ages was much less believable and much less imaginable than a, mess, than a Messiah. That may be strange to us, but it's true. Our life is literally unthinkable to a medieval Jew. On, on, on many, many, many levels, I mean, come on, you know? As I, as I have said before, when I was a kid, we all thought that you would fly around in jetpacks when, when we were older. Nobody thought you would carry all of human knowledge in your pocket. Nobody thought that, right? That was crazy. Um, so it was literally unthinkable. And knowing that unthinkable things happen, maybe we shouldn't be so quick uh, to dismiss the Messiah just because it's hard for us to imagine. Um, and, uh, and I will, uh, I will read for you Emet Bi which was the, uh, 
which was the statement of principles of the conservative movement many years ago, that was written, says, um, to refer to these doctrines as metaphors in no way diminishes their significance. No human being can live without a dream. As conservative Jews, we affirm the substance of classical Jewish eschatological, that's messianic thinking. Its central thrust is that in partnership with God, we can create an ever more perfect social order. There you go. Okay, questions, comments, disagreements. Um, yes, Annie. Uh, when, when is the first time that uh, the, the idea of Messiah comes up in the Torah? So it comes up in the Torah. Mashiach in Hebrew means to be anointed. Mashiach Basham is what it says, to be anointed with oil. So whenever a king is anointed, when Saul is anointed, when David is anointed, they're anointed with oil and they're the Mashiach. But the transformation gradually happens of a Mashiach who is an earthly king to a Mashiach who is more than. And, and that happens in part through the line of David. Remember, at the very end of creation, very end of Genesis, God says to Judah um, that the scepter will never depart from him. In other words, the line of Judah is going to be the kingship forever. So now you start to have these elements that combine together. Here's one family, one line that is going to be king forever. Um, David establishes Jerusalem. Um, God promises that the temple will be restored. It gets restored. It's destroyed again. The idea, the idea of the futurity of it, that one day David will be, the, the line of David will be the Messiah, is develops gradually, but develops through originally anointing kings, and then you'll anoint the final king. So, and, and then there are images about how the Messiah will come riding into Jerusalem and the donkey, um, which comes from Zechariah, but then is used, I mean, the, the Jewish way of viewing the story of Jesus basically is these are the tropes that were set up for messianism. So these are the tropes that someone who wanted to be a messiah or wanted to describe a messiah would use in describing a messiah. Because the time of Jesus, there were many, many false messiahs. Um, so it's not surprising everybody who knew the Messiah is going to do this, 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 and this. So if you had someone who you thought was a Messiah, either they would do that, as happened later with like Shaktai Tzvi, he would do certain things that a Messiah is supposed to do, or Shaktai Tzvi being the most famous false Messiah um, in Jewish history. Um, so he would do things either, or he would be described by his disciples as having done them later whether they were true or not. Because remember, the Gospels were written after Jesus, not at his time. Um, and Shaphat Tzvi also had a chronicler who wrote about him, who was deeply versed, Nathan of Gaza was deeply versed in Jewish texts and knew how to describe him in a way that people would say, oh my God, well, if he did this, this, and this, he's a real king. Yeah, in the time of the Messiah, at least in theory, all the dead are supposed to be resurrected. Um, there's an argument, actually, in Maimonidean history, which is probably why he wrote about the resurrection of the dead, about whether he believed it or not. Um, there were accusations in his own time that he didn't, so he wrote this and said, no, 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 I, I do. Um, but, uh, and you can understand why for someone like Maimonides, it was a harder thing to credit than other things, because, you know, Resurrection of the dead is not an easy thing to believe. Um, although, as it says in Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin is the tractate of the Talmud that has most of this messianic speculation. And it says there, if God can make a person from dust, no reason God can't make a person again from dust. Right? If you did it once, it doesn't seem so hard to do it again. Um, but, uh, but at least in theory, one of the visions of the messianic age is that everybody will be resurrected and everybody will end up in Israel, um, which is why people want to be buried on the Mount of Olives, right? Because when you're there, you're there. Whereas for the rest of us, LAX is going to be like a nightmare. Um, no, there are, there are actually, there are like visions 
images of like tubes and people rolling to Jerusalem and so on because the medieval imagination didn't have flying, right? Um, but but uh, it was so um, it was so deeply believed that like in a in a medieval a little later than that diary, Buckle of Hamlet, she talks about the time the time of Shabtai to be people literally sold all their belongings and on the appointed day like stood up on the roof of their houses expecting to be magically transported to Jerusalem. And it's the selling all your belongings that you believe, right? You don't sell your stuff if you think, eh, it could go south, right? But a lot of Jews really believed it. Um, and, and so the messianic belief in Jewish history was really strong. Are there any uh, uh, antecedents to Judaism about uh, a messianic concept, or did Judaism introduce that concept to? It's a great question. Are there antecedents to Judaism about a messianic concept? There are certainly salvational figures. I don't know if there is something that is really close to, at the end of time, someone will come and redeem this people and save the world. Um, I don't know that any tradition was universalistic enough to worry about saving the world. Uh, but it's a great question. Nothing like from Babylonia or something? No, not, that, not that I know of, but right. no, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, Rabbi, I think it's a brilliant, concise presentation. I, know, I also sometimes teach about Messianism on the Kudus. Thank you. You encapsulated everything. And you personally, do you believe that uh, modern Israel, restored Israel, is a collective Mashiach? Know, this is cool for, and the, the restoration of Israel is the first step towards the same era. So we say that on Shabbat, Rishit Smichat Kulatenu, it's the beginning of the flowering of our redemption. Um, so I, 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 I'm of two minds about it. I mean, on the one hand, I'm not a supernaturalist that way. That is, um, I think. God's operations in history are really, we ought to be modest and humble about pointing to them and saying, this is the operation in history. You know, I remember, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going, I am not going to say something negative about uh, a nominally Jewish organization. Okay, I remember the Kabbalah Center, which that why I say it's a nominally Jewish organization. I don't really feel bad about saying something negative about it, so here goes. The Kabbalah Center put out this video about how they were responsible through Kabbalah for the Oslo Accords. And then the Oslo Accords went very south and they withdrew the video, okay? <laughs> and, and this just reminded me that we should be really careful about, um, I mean, there is something, I can't help but feel there's something miraculous about the establishment of the modern state. At the same time, I really also believe that every miracle is in part in our hands. And could we wreck it? God forbid? Yeah. Could we do stuff that would prove that it wasn't the... But if we, we being collectively the Jewish people, but especially obviously the people of Israel, um, I think if they tend it right, then yes, that is a real possibility. That's my hope anyway. A follow-up question. Yes, um, I've heard that it's said that in the Islamic age, only Jewish holidays are going to be not be observed except for one, right. which is Puri. Why? Well, first of all, let me just say that this is to say the Messianic age, this will happen or that will happen, <laughs> is not a statement of dogma or doctrine. Um, it's just like the rabbis were always saying, do this, you'll get a long haba. Do that, you won't get a long haba. And, and this is, it's almost like saying, do this and it's really good. I don't think they always mean it literally. Um, so uh, I guess you could make a lot, you could give a lot of different reasons why for it. Just like they say, all the sacrifices will be abolished except the sacrifice of Thanksgiving. So maybe gratitude and the sense of salvation will be the most important things, and you should never forget that. Although if that's true, why not Pesach? Um, uh, 
Uh, or it could be because uh, Purim is the holiday that reminds us how terrible it is to be outside the land of Israel and how dangerous. And in the Messianic age, all the Jews will be gathered into the land of Israel. That's possible. Or I'll give you one more. Purim is the, the Megillah is the one place that doesn't mention God's name. So we should remember that at a time, in the Messianic time, when God is completely manifest, that in earlier times it was hard to find God. Maybe. But I don't really know. Yeah, Jen. Hey, um, thank you. Sure. It's brilliant, as always. Um, what I wondered is, uh, what I wondered is, uh, aside from the Messianic age, let's just talk about the Messiah. How, what is God's relationship, God's relationship to the Messiah? Because now you've got a Messiah. God sends the Messiah to deliver the world, basically. Because God works for human agency. Right? right? God sends Moses. Why does God need Moses? God could just, you know, deliver the Egyptian, the Israelites, God's self. But God always works through human agency in this world, so the Messiah is going to be God's shalit, God's messenger. Yeah, in a big, big way. In a big way. In a big way. Yeah. So. Sure. That's actually, that's a big subject about what meets vote, if any meets vote. No, 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 I, I mean, the, the, it's, it's discussed a lot, and it's not, I mean, there, are, there isn't one view of it about what will happen in a messianic age and what meets vote will be observed and what meets vote will not be observed and so on. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't know why, but I seem to remember somewhere, maybe from you years ago, that the messianic age would come or the messiah would come if all the Jews fulfilled all the commands uh, uh, or all the mitzvot. All the mitzvot or That's observe two Shabbatot in a row. There are two? a lot of those. Yeah. Only two? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of those uh, that that this I if we did this the messiah would come. By the way, this was a big tradition among the Hasidic rebbe's too. A big tradition. I remember there's there's like some story, uh, I don't remember if it was, I think it was Rebbe Nachman. Oh no, it was, it was uh, Luria who asked his students at some point, you know, will you come with me to Jerusalem to celebrate Shabbat? And they said, well, we have to check with our families, but, but we will. And he said, had you just said yes, the Messiah would have come, right? Which, which is a real guilt trip. Can you imagine? <laughs> you go home and you say to your wife, because of you, the Messiah, didn't, I had to check with you, so the Messiah didn't come. Um, so there's, there is a lot of, of, uh, of that, but yeah, the, the observance of Shabbat um, or observing the mitzvot, all those things were supposed to bring the Messiah, but you know, yeah. Carol. How do you explain <coughs> why people have a yearning for something that isn't yet actualized and how does one deal with yearning for a messiah rather than you could work towards it or you could do good work so well why would you work towards it if you didn't yearn for it right, so Aviva Zornberg how many of you great biblical scholar teacher from Israel um, really has written brilliant books on Truly brilliant book. She also got it. She got her PhD in English literature from uh, Cambridge, um, and wrote her PhD on Middlemarch on George Eliot and Middlemarch. I wrote to her several years ago. We know each other somewhat, and I asked her for a PhD. I read her PhD on Middlemarch. It was brilliant. She is brilliant. Um, anyway, her first book on Torah was on Genesis, and if you've never read Aviva Zornberg, I strongly recommend it. And, and uh, it, her book was called The Beginning of Desire, and it was be based on a quote from Wallace Stevens, not to have is the beginning of desire. So I would say the same thing. The beginning of desire for a Messiah is to live in an un unredeemed world. You know, what, when, you, when, when somebody is sick or somebody dies or some terrible thing happens, what do you think? The world shouldn't be arranged this way. 
is it, will there ever be a time when the world is not arranged this way? So I think that that's, you know, it's, it's like the cure-all for everything that ails us. So who doesn't want that at times? I mean, yeah, in theory, we would say, no, we still want struggle, we still want this, we still want that. Um, but at times, which if it's bad enough, that's all you want. I mean, can you imagine how much prayer there was for the Messiah in the camps? It must have been constant, you know, just bring the Messiah and make this stop. So, all right. Thank you very much.